Chapter 1 Our Picture of the Universe A well-known scientist, some say it was Bertrand Russell, one gave a public lecture on astronomy. He described it, how the Earth orbits around the Sun and how the Sun, in turn, orbits around the center of the vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little la old lady at the back of the room got up and said, What you have thought of this for rabbits? The world it's really a flat flat supported on the back of the giant tortoise. The scientist gave a superior smile before replying. What is a tortoise standing on? You're very clever, young man, very clever. Said the old man, said the old lady. But it's charters all the way down. Most people will find the picture of our universe as an infinite tower of tortoises, rather, for the coast. Why? Why do we think we know better? What do we know about the universe? And how do we know it? Where the universe come from and where it is going? Did the universe have a beginning? And if so, what happens before then? What, what is the nature of time? Will it ever come to an end? Can we go back in time? Rise and break truths in physics made possible in part by fantastic new technologies, Sega's answers to some of these long standing questions. Someday, these answers may seem as obvious to us as the Earth orbiting the Sun, or perhaps as recalls as a tower of tortoises. Only time, whatever that may be, will tell. As long ago as 344 calendar, the Greek philosopher Aristotle in his book on the heavens, was able to put forward two good arguments for believing that the earth was a round sphere rather than a flat plat. First, he realized that eclipses of the moon were caused by the earth coming between the sun and the moon. The earth's shadow on the moon was always always run, which would be true only if the earth ha was spherical. If the earth has been a flat disk, the side would have been along elongated and, and elliptical unless the exilive uh, was occurred at a time when the sign was when the sun was directly under the center of the disk. Second, the Greeks knew from their travel that the North Star appeared lower in the sky when viewed in the south that then it did in more northerly regions since the north star leads over the north pole 
it appears to be directly above an observer's observer at the North Pole, but to someone looking from the equator, it appears to lie just at the horizon. From the difference in the apparent position of the North Star in Egypt and Greece, Aristotle even quote an estimate that the distance around the Earth was 400,000 stadia. It is not known exactly what length a stadium was, but it, but it may have been have been about 200 yards, which will make Aristotle's estimate about twice the currently the currently achieved figure. The Greek even had a third argument that the Earth must be wrong. For why else does one foresee the sails of a ship coming over the horizon, and only later see the full, see the whole? Aristotle thought the Earth was stationary, and that the Sun, the Moon, the planets. And the stars move in circular orbits about the Earth. He believed this because he felt, for mystical reasons, that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that circular motion was the most perfect. This idea was elaborated by Ptolemy, Ptolemy in the second century AAD dot into a complex cosmological model. The earth the, the earth stood at the center surrounded by eight spheres that carried the moon, the sun, the stars, and the five planets known at the time, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter, Saturn. The planet themselves move on a smaller circle attached to their perspective spares in order to count for their rather complicated observed path in the sky. The outermost spear carried the so-called fixed stars, which was tied in the same position relative to each other, but which rot rotated together across the sky. What lay beyond the last spear was never made every uh, very clear, but it certainly was not part of mankind's observable universe. The Ptolemy's model provided a reasonably accurate system for predicting the position of heavenly bodies in the sky, but in order to predict this position correctly, the Ptolemy had to make an assumption that the moon followed a path that sometimes grew in twice as close to the earth as at all the time, and that means that the moon oak sometimes to appear twice as big as, uh, as at other times. Ptolemy recognized this play, but nevertheless this, his model was generally, without, not universally accepted. accepted. 
It was adopted by the Christian crutch as the picture of the universe that was in accordance with scripture for it had the great advantage that it left lots of room outside the sphere of fixed star for heaven and hell oh look the picture wow mm, this is the model of Ptolemy interesting yeah because you go thinking about the universe okay continue to, to read the book a simpler model, however, was proposed in 1514 by a Polish priest, Polish priest Nicholas Copernicus. At first, perhaps for fear of being branched a uh, heretic by his crunch. Copernicus curated his model anonymously. His idea was that the sun was stationary at the center and that the earth and the planet move in circular orbits around the sun. Nearly a century passed before this idea was taken seriously. Then to astronomers, the German Johannes Kepler and the Italian Galileo Galilei start publicly, publicly to support the Copernican theory. Despite the fact that the orbit, the orbit is predicted, did not quite match the ones observed. The depth blow to the Aristotelian or Ptolemaic theory came in 1609. In that year, Galileo start, started observing the night sky with a telescope which had just been invented. When he looked at the planet Jupiter, Galileo found that it was accompanied by several small satellites or moons that orbit around it. This implied that everything that didn't did not have to orbit directly around the Earth, as Aristotle and Ptolemy had touched. It was, of course, still possible to believe that the Earth was the nary at the center of the universe and that the moons of Jupiter move on extremely complicated paths around the Earth, giving the appearance that the orbited Jupiter. However, Copernicus' theory was much simpler. At the same time, Johannes Kepler had modified Copernicus' theory, suggesting that the planets move not in circle but in ellipses. An ellipse, an ellipse, is an elongated circle. The predictions now finally met the observations. As far as Kepler was concerned, elliptical orbits were merely an ad hoc hypothesis, and a rather repugnant one at that because ellipses were clearly less perfect than circles. 
having discovered almost by accident that elliptical orbit fit the observations well. He could not reconcile he could not reconcile them with his idea that the planets were made to orbit the sun by magnetic force. An explanation was provided only much later in one thousand six hundred and eighty seven. One share Isaac Newton replaced his philosophy naturalist principia mathematica or probably the most important single work ever published in the physical science in it newton not only put forward a theory of how bodies move in space and time but he also developed the the complicated mathematics needed to analyze the motions. In addition, Newton postulated a law of universal gravitation according to which each body in the universe in the universe was attracted toward every other body by a force that was stronger the more massive the bodies and the closer they were to each other. There was this same force that caused objects to fall to the ground. The story that Newton was inspired by an apple hitting his head is almost strangely apocryphal. All Newton himself emphasized was that the idea of gravity came to him as he sat in a calm contemplative mood and was occasioned by the fall of an apple. Newton went on a soul. Newton went on to show that according to his law Gravity causes the moon to move in an elliptical orbit around the earth and causes the earth and the planet to follow elliptical paths around the sun. The Copernican model got rid of Ptolemy's celestial spares and with them the idea that the universe had a natural boundary since fixed stars did not appear to change their positions apart from a rotation across the sky caused by the earth spinning on its axis. It became, it became natural to suppose that the fixed stars were objects like our sun, our sun, but very much farther away. Newton realized that, according to his theory of gravity, the stars should attract each other, so it seemed they could not remain essentially. motionless. Would they not all fall together at some point in a letter in 1691 to record badly another leading thinker of his day, Newton a good that this world indeed indeed happen if there were only a finite numbers a finite number of stars distributed over a finite region of space but he reasoned that if on the other hand 
there were an infinite number of stars distributed more or less uniformly over infinite space. This would not happen because there will not be any central point of them to fall to. This argument is an instance of the pitfalls that you can encounter in talking about infinity. In an infinite universe, every point can be regarded as the center, because every point has an infinite number of stars on each side of it. The correct approach it was realized only much later is to consider the finite situation in which the stars all fall in on each other and then to ask how things change if one adds more stars rightly uniformly distributed outside this region. According to the Newton's law, the extra stars would make no difference at all to the original ones on average, so the stars will fall in just as fast. We can add as many stars as we like, but, but they will still always collapse in on them themselves. We now know it is impossible to have an infinite static model of the universe in which gravity is always attractive. It is an interesting reflection on the general climate of touch before the 20th century that no one had suggested that the universe was expanding or contracting. It was generally accepted that either the universe had excited forever in an unchanging state or that it had been created at a finite time in the past more or less as we observe it today. In part, this may have been due to people's tendency to believe in eternal thought, as well as the comfort they found in the touch that even though they may grow old and die, the universe is eternal and unchanging. Even those who realize that Newton's theory of gravity saw that the universe could not be static did not think to suggest that it might be expanding. Instead, the app tended to modify the theory of making the gravitational force repulsive at very large distance. This did not significantly affect the predictions of the motion of the planet, but it allowed an infinite distribution of stars to remain in equilibrium with the attractive force between nearby stars blended by the repulsive force from those that were farther away. However, we now believe such an equilibrium world be unstable. If the stars in some region got only slightly nearer its other, the attractive force between them Why? Between them, world 
become stronger and dominant offer the repulsive force so that the stars will continue to fall towards each other on the other hand if the stars cut a bit farther farther far farther away from each other the repulsive force will dominate and drive them farther apart another objection to an infinite static universe is normally ascribed to the german philosopher henrik albers who wrote about his this theory in 1823 in fact first company contemporaries of Newton had raised the problem and the older and the Albert article was not even the first to contain plausible arguments against it it was however the first to be widely not the difficulty is that in an infinite static universe nearly every line of sight World and on the surface of a star. Thus, one would expect that the whole sky would be as bright, break, bright at as the sun. Even at night. Albert's counter-argument was that the light from distant stars will be dimmed with absorption, absorption by intervening matters. However, if that happened, the intervening matter would eventually have head up until its cloud as brightly as the stars the only way of avoiding the conclusion that the whole of the night sky shall be as bright break as the surface of the sun will be as assumed that the stars had not been shining forever but had turned on at some finite time in the past in that case the options of ab ab absorbing matter might not have heated up yet or the light from distant stars might not yet have reached us and that brings us to the question of what could have caused the stars to have turned on in the first place the beginning of the universe had of course been discussed long before this according to a number of early cosmologists and the Jewish Christian Muslim tradition the universe starts at a finite and not very distant time in the past one argument for such a beginning was the feeling that it was surely to have first cause to explain the existence of the universe within the universe you always explained one event as being caused by some other events but the existence of the universe itself could be explained 
in this way only if it had some beginning. Another argument was put forward by Augustine in his book, The City of God. He pointed out that civilization is progressing and we remember we perform this death or develop it that technique technically this man and so also perhaps the universe could not have been round at that long Augustine accepted a death of about five thousand before calendar for the creation of the universe according to the book of Genesis. It is interesting that this is not so far from the end of the last ice age about ten thousand before calendar which is when archaeologists tell us that civilization already began aristotle and most of the other greek philosophers on the other hand did not like the idea of the creation because it's make too much of divine intervention they believe therefore that the human race and the world around it had existed and world exists for effort. The ancients had already considered the argument about progress described it above and answered it by saying that there had been periodic food or other disaster that rapidly set the human race right back to the beginning of civilization. The questions of whether the universe had a beginning in time and whether it is limited in space were later extensively examined by the philosopher Immanuel Kant in his monumental and very obscure work Critical of Pure Reason published in 1781 he called this questions antinomies antinomies that is contradictions of pure reason because he felt that there were equally compelling argument, arguments for believing the thesis that the universe had a beginning and the antithesis that it had excited for efforts. His argument for the thesis was that if the universe did not have a beginning, there will be an infinite period of time before any events, which he considered absurd. The argument for the antithesis was that if the universe had a beginning, There will be an infinite period of time before it. So why? So why should the universe begin at any one particular time? In fact, his cases per boot, the thesis and the antithesis are really the same argument. They are both based on his unspoken assumptions that time continues back forever whether or not the universe has excited you forever 
As we shall see, the concept of time has no meaning before the beginning of the universe. This was first pointed out by Augustine when asked, What did God do before he created the universe? Augustine didn't reply. He was preparing how for people who ask such questions. Instead, he said that time was a properly of the universe that God created, and that time did not exist before the beginning of the universe. When most people believe it, in an essentially static and unchanging universe, the question of whether or not it had a beginning was really one of the metaphysics of theology or theology. When called a cone for what was observed, equally went well on the theory that the universe had excited for efforts or on the theory that it was set in motion at some finite time in such a manner as to look as touch it has excited for efforts. But in one nine twenty nine at Wayne Humble met a landmark observation landmark offer the landmark observation that wherever wherever you look these ten galaxies are moving rapidly away from us. In other words, the universe is expanding. This means that at earlier time, objects will have been closer together. In fact, it seemed that there was time about 10 or 20,000 million years ago when they were all at exactly the same place and when, therefore, the density of the universe was infinite. This discovery finally brought the question of the beginning of the universe into a realm, the realm of science. Of science. Humble's observations suggested that there was a time called the Big Bang when the universe was infinite, infinitesimally small and inf infinitely dense. Under such conditions, all the laws of science and therefore our old ability to predict the future will break down. If there were events earlier than this time, then they called no effects what happened at the present time. Their existence can be ignored because it will have no observational consequence. One might say that time had a beginning at a Big Bang in the sense that earlier times simply would not be defined. It shall be, it shall be in passage that this beginning in time is very different from those that had been considered previously. In an unchanging universe, a beginning in time is something that has to be imposed by some being outside the universe. There is no physical necessity for a beginning. One can imagine 
that you could create the universe at literally any time in the past. On the other hand, if the universe is expanding, there may be physical reasons why there had to be a beginning. When God still imagined that God created the universe at the instant of the Big Bang, or even afterwards, in just such a way as to make it look as such, there had been a Big Bang. But it would be a meaningless to suppose that it was created before the Big Bang. An expanding universe does not preclude, preclude a creator, but it does place limits on when he might have created of his job. In order to talk about the nature of the universe and to discuss questions such as whether it has a beginning or an end, you have to be clear about what a scientific theory is. So, take the simple-minded view that a theory is just a model of the universe or a restricted part of it and a set of rules that relate quantities in the, in, a, in, in the model to observations that we make. It exists only in our means and does not have any other reality, whatever that might mean. A theory is a good theory if it satisfies two requirements. It must accurately describe a large class of observation on the basis of a model that contains only a few arbitrary elements arbitrary element and it must make definite predictions about the results of future observation. For example, Aristotle believed Empedocles theory that everything was made out of four elements art, air, fire and water. It was simple enough but did not make any defining prediction. On the other hand, Newton's theory of gravity was based on a, an even simpler model in which bodies attracted each other with a force that was proportional to a quantity called the mass and in, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, yet it predicts the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets to a high degree of accuracy. Any physical theory is always professional, professional in the sense that it is only a hypothesis, you can never prove it. No matter how many times the results of experiments agree with some theory, you can never be sure that the next time the result will not contradict the theory. On the other hand, you can disprove a theory by finding even a single observation that is great disagrees with the prediction of the theory. As a philosopher of science, Karl Popper has emphasized, a good theory is characterized by the fact that it makes a number of predictions that could, in principle, be disproved disproof of fallacy field by observation. As time 
new experiments are observed to agree with a prediction, the theory survives and our confidence in it increases. But it's if ever a new observation is found to disagree, we have to abandon or modify, modify the theory. At least that is what it's supposed to happen, but you can always question the competence of the person who carry out the observation. In practice, what often happens is that a new theory is devised that is really an extension of the nefarious theory. For example, very accurate very accurate observation of the planet Mercury revealed a small difference between its motion and the prediction of Newton's theory of gravity. Einstein's general theory, general theory of relativity predicted a slightly different motion from Newton's theory. The fact that Einstein's prediction matched what was seen well, while Newton did not was one of the crucial confirmations of the new theory. However, we still use Newton's theory for all practical purposes because the difference between its prediction and those of general relativity is very small in the situation that we normally deal with. Newton's theory also has the great advantage that it is much simpler to work with and with than Einstein's 